Um, I would like to, uh, I've got three three new members to um, welcome. Um, Ian Green, who's the head teacher from Rugby Free School. Uh, Ian was an observer at our, our March meeting and liked it so much he's decided to come back. Um, Jill Bowser, um, head teacher from Stocking Ford Academy, and Suzanne Whiston, uh, who's the head teacher of Oakwood Secondary School, so um, a special school. So welcome to you three. Um, in the interest of transparency, I would uh, declare that uh, although I'm elected to this forum as a uh, maintained representative of Whitestone Infant School, where I'm a governor, I am also <coughs> Jill's chair of governors at Stockingford Primary. So just to uh, make that clear. <clears throat> OK. Um, Darby, would you like to go through the apologies, please? Yeah, we've got apologies from Alison Ramsey, Amy Woodward, Ian Green, Rebecca Harrison, Sivan Robertson, Peter Husband, Ricky Ams, Kerry Clare, Marion Burrows, and Claire Jeffs-Boss, and also Councillor Kamako. And just to let you know, Ross uh, Cross will be joining us a bit late. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much for that. OK. Um, item two is um, voting and actions from the last meeting. They have been circulated prior to this meeting. Does anybody have any issues they want to raise with them? OK, <clears throat> so um, item three um, is, is our only matter for decision today, and it's an update on the scheme for financing schools. So, Panima. Thanks, Phil. Um... So just because we have some new members that weren't here for the uh, for the previous meeting, I'll, I'll just run through um, what we do with the scheme for the financing of schools. So first of all, it, it is a, an item for decision and that's a, um, just for the maintained schools only. We need the votes for this, please. Um, so this relates to the scheme of financing of schools. Um, back in, the, in March, um, I presented um, the potential changes that proposed changes to, to update our scheme so that it would be in line with the DFE blueprint for the scheme, essentially. Um, literally days after the March, meeting the DFE then released a few more changes so the consultation that came out um, I made sure that we included all of the changes and actually um, in order to be in better alignment of when the DFE issue their changes I'm proposing that the proposal comes to the June meeting in future and then is approved finally by schools forum in the September meeting that will mean that we are absolutely at our most up-to-date in terms of the DFE blueprint um, the changes then that I'm looking for approval for are what we consulted on um, and essentially that they're, they're minor changes um, and they're highlighted on page 15 and 19 of the appendix and they relate to the proceeds of the sale of assets and also the treatment of leases. Um, we did consult on those and um, that consultation responses are itemised in section 2.2 of the report. Essentially, there were no objections. Um, and so I am looking for um, Schools Forum, please, to, sorry, maintain schools within Schools Forum to please um, approve the updated scheme as per the, the appendix to this report. OK, do our uh, maintained schools representative have any questions or comments on that? OK, we'll move to the recommendation then. Um, if you'd like to show uh, by raising your, your using the raise hand uh, function, um, all those in favour, please. got three yeah okay how many have we got three three right are there any against okay we'll take that recommendation as approved then thank you thank you <clears throat> and um going back to uh going back to my introduction i apologize because i should have introduced um, Liz Firmston, who is um, going to be, is replacing um, Panima on this uh, forum after Panima's uh, promotion to her new role. So, um, formally welcome you, um, Liz, to the uh, to the uh, forum, and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item four. Then we've got 
Uh, the rest of the items on here are uh, matters for information and comments. Hopefully we can get some comments. Um, so item four um, is the uh, DSG outturn for 2023-24. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Phil. So um, the papers for the DSG outturn for 23-24, uh, and it sets out the position as at the end of um, March this year. Um, the overall position this year was an overspend of 17.118 million. Um, this was a decrease to what we forecast showed in our forecast at period 10 in our last schools forum report in March of 2.332 million. This decrease has primarily been due to um, the reduction in growth funding required this year due to slippage and also um, a reduction in the post-16 spend that we were forecasting. While the overall overspend is 17.118 million, it should be noted that obviously um, this is over all four blocks and the key financial risk to this is 19.072 million, which was the high needs block overspend at the end of the year. I say we all know that the pressures on the high needs block aren't unique to Warwickshire and it's quite a national issue um, as part of that, but we are looking to address our issues through the DSG recovery plan and as part of the DBV programme which I believe is one of our next reports as well. Um, the overall outturn did give us a 3.06% overspend on our original DSG. So the DFE do require, require us to have a DSG recovery plan, which we have got in place. Which brings us to our reserves. So that brings our closing reserve balance for the DSG at an overspend position of 33.215 million. And that is quite large already. Um, that is being offset at the moment by an offset reserve which the council is holding which was 26.505 and has been increased to match the cumulative deficit at year end. Um, I believe we've got about 18 million in the plan to for next year for the increase um, but after that we haven't got any more in council reserves to fund that so we'll be looking at other options made that made available from central government. Section four of the report goes through all the different um, unders and overspends of the uh, four blocks. I say I, I mentioned the two main changes since last time on the schools block and the high needs block. Early years block and central block remained largely unchanged. Um, and at that point, I will leave it there because I'm sure you've all read it and go to questions on those areas instead, if that's OK. OK, thank you. Questions or comments, members, please. You've stunned them all into silence. <laughs> so it's that it's that very large overspend figure. I know it's it everybody. <laughs> um, so going back to paragraph three point two, um, in terms of the authority uh, taking advantage of the statutory override from April twenty twenty five, what's the implications of that then for us? Shall I come in on this, Steph? Yes, yes please. please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. The the statutory override, we actually only have one financial year left of the statutory override, and it will be 2025-26. Uh, um, until then, we have been um, contributing into our offset reserve. Um, but as a, as a local authority, we can no longer afford to do that. So the 18 million that we contribute this financial year will be the last year that we do that. So options after 25-26 are that the central government will um, extend the statutory override to further years, which will mean that local authorities across the council will continue to build this cumulative um, deficit associated with the high needs block. But ultimately, that's not sustainable. So at some point, the central government will need to do something else. Um, let's pretend we live in an ideal world. And in that ideal world, central government would um, essentially write off those cumulative deficit balances. Coming back to the real world, the more likely um, position will be central government will allow us to um, capitalise that money, which will essentially mean we take out borrowing, local authorities take out borrowing in order to fund that deficit. Really, all that's doing is putting greater pressure on revenue budgets in order to be able to fund that borrowing. So it's far from ideal. Um, but if I had to put a bet on it, that's where I would imagine it goes. I don't know if anybody else would like to come in on that. So basically, the, the only thing we can do is press on with our uh, recovery plan, isn't it? And uh, and keep looking at that and see uh, 
uh, we can see if we can uh, stop that deficit increasing and uh, over a period of time, um, hopefully turn it round. Uh, Nikki. Yeah, I guess just the just to have that confirmation for all that for the early years block and the underspend. So I guess we're saying that the underspend is going to hopefully cover the adjustment with all the different funding options that uh, the government are put into play um, throughout this year and continues through next year. You're hoping that's what the underspend will adjust. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, as a, uh, we, we obviously manage the DSG budget as a whole. Uh, Nikki, uh, but yeah, that will be essentially what we're doing. We we know the both this year and and it's, it will be twice this year that we get a change in in provision for early years, both April and in September, and then the change we get next year. Um, so we will be working towards it. Basically, you know, until we get the data, because we've only been using estimates at the moment of, um, and it was it was data that wasn't wasn't even based on nine month nine month old children. It was based on the two on a, an assumption of two year olds. Um, so you know we're we we're, we're a bit running blind and using national data, which isn't always um, doesn't always always shadow exactly what boy, what she follows. But we're, we're hopefully hopefully we'll be close enough, and we'll and we'll have some um, underspends to cover if there is an, an under allocation from central government, which will then be picked up in the in the in the following full year of everything. If you get on me. Thank you. OK, thanks, Nikki. Um, Blake Francis, you had your uh, hand up. Has, has your query been answered? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. OK, all right. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no further questions on that, we'll move on to the the next item, uh, which is uh, delivering better value program. Okay. Phil, do we want Phil? to have, wait till Ross comes in? Is, 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 yeah. is that what you're going to say to me? Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and waffle <laughs> a bit longer to, to give no, you a few more right. minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, we'll but move um, on to you then, Brian, on item six, so uh, we're yeah. delegation uh, timetable. Yeah. Right, thank you. In the meantime, Dalby, can you just message Ross and tell him we're probably going to finish in about five or ten minutes on my item? Probably yes, five I minutes. Do that. Yeah, that's thank fine. you. Okay, um, hold on a second. I promise you, I'm not. Um, You're not playing for time, Brian. I'm not playing for time. <laughs> well, I, I am because I've just realised I put the. Hold on, I put the wrong report up. Hold on. Different. Don't that's show us anything we shouldn't say, Brian. No, that's it's a public meeting. That is, that's fine. <laughs> that's next. That's ne that's my next meeting. <laughs> right. Um, yes, this is for information only, and it's purely about the just just to get your your opinions on the timetable that we're proposing for the consultation. So it's not about the the pros and cons of, of any of anything that will be in the consultation. This is purely about the timing of the consultation. OK, that, that's why it's only for information only. Um, there'll be two main 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 consultations. One will be the um, the, the um, for the maintained school representatives only. That includes so that the maintained schools and the one maintained primary schools and the one secondary school. Um, and that will be on about the de-delegation funding. And the second one will be is if um, as a local authority, we propose to move any funding from between the blocks. And that primary would po po probably be from the schools block to the high needs block, as we did, as we proposed last year. Um, the if we go into sort of page two, that's basically what 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 we what what are the elements of de-delegation. Um, nothing has changed from last year. Exactly the, the same items. Um, same items we're still asking to to de-delegate. Um, and the timings are there. I think they're pretty similar to last year, Delby. If I'm right. Yes, they are, Brian. Oh, yes, they are. Let's ask. Thanks, yeah. Steph. Yeah. Um, and then the national funding formula transfer between any blocks. Um, that's the same sort of, sort of timetable. Um, we, we've put a few different dates just because of because of timing wise. Obviously, the um, the deadline for submitting the application is still up in the air from the education funding agency. So we will find out that and let people know as soon as possible. But that's the general picture. 
Um, I won't waffle anymore because Ross is back in the room. Uh, <laughs> I hopefully, um, hopefully that's that's clear. And everyone has anyone got any comments or anything that they don't particularly like about the timetable? So, in terms of the due delegation, we're going to take that decision in um, September. Is that right? Yes. And the the interesting decision about transfer between blocks, we're going to take we take that one in November when we're meeting in person. Is that correct? Yes. So bring all your rotten tomatoes along to that meeting. Yep, we'll bring our we'll bring our uh, our crash helmets. Yeah, thank you. Hard hats. <laughs> yeah, um, Nikki. Yeah, I just think those dates will work. Just a quick thought, thinking back to um, one of our last meetings, we thought about is there a way we can try and look at a way get more responses. We thought about maybe is there a different way we can have the questionnaire out. Um, so is. How, how is it going to get sent out this time, Brian? Just a thought. Cause it was just, just pay me back to our last we, meeting when we. Is this for the um, the, the tra block transfer one? Nick? Yeah. So, so there's two elements of this um, that we have yet to discuss. I say, as part of um, all the transfer that happened this year, we will be working more closely this year with the DFE in order to get more advice on um, how we frame that consultation and how it goes out. Um, but yes, we would also look to maybe change the format. As part of that, yeah, yeah. So we can get as many people responding, yeah, as, yeah. as we that, can, because we know the numbers are as low, and it's really hard for schools forum. Then, how do we reach everybody? Yeah, they've. I mean, as, as part of the um, prerequisite of getting the, the disapplication this year, we've got a set of things we have to we have to do. Like we have to meet the DFE three or four times a year, and one of those things is to discuss about the next the next year's application, which which we'll be doing if we do, if we as an authority choose to do that. Um, and as for the the other the um, the, the uh, de delegation, we've just tested today the the uh, the online form that's going out, uh, so that'll be going out as soon as um, well as soon after this meeting as possible. Mm -hmm. Panima. Yeah, Panima. Thank, thank you. you. I just wanted to build on on what Nikki mentioned actually, and and wondered if there was any um, discussion worth having today about how we could potentially engage better or more with schools in order to get responses from that consultation. Um, as school representatives, governors, heads here today, yeah. do you have any ideas as to how we can maximise our responses to that consultation? Well, yeah, I was going to say to say, uh, Panima, I think I, the the school, um, as 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 the people who are representing schools, whether it's as head teachers or as governors, I think we've got to um, really go out to um, to our schools and into the consortia uh, mm -hmm. through the heads and say and, and emphasise the importance of this, how controversial it is each year, and uh, how important it is that when. Um, the representatives on this forum come to make that decision that we can make as, as well informed a decision as possible. So uh, I think we have to commit to uh, to doing that um, as as um, school representatives. Um, so um, Blake, Blake Francis, please. I think during that um, kind of consultation, it's important to perhaps get a real understanding of the actual impact that that's had in in schools in terms of the reduction in in uh, funding to the actual school at the centre. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I mean, obviously, people have the opportunity to send comments in and uh, when those comments come in, we, we you know, we uh, read them. Um, and try and understand those implications before we vote. And I think all of us who are representing schools, um, we've had, we've had a, um, a, a fairly tough budget round this year. I don't think that's, I'm, I'm sure that's uh, that's true for everybody. And uh, yeah, I think uh, obviously we can, we have to take that into account. Um, Johnny. <clears throat> Thanks, Phil. I was going to say we have a monthly strategic meeting with head teachers at the partnership board so i can take items there if you want on behalf of schools forum to say this is the consultation this is what's going on um just to raise that profile and to um get people to respond yeah if 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 people feel that that's appropriate yeah absolutely and i'm sure you'll put it on a heads up as well won't you Yes, Sorry, say that again. So I've got a bad connection here. <laughs> Sorry, you, I'm sure you'll put that on heads up as well, won't you? We do. Yeah, as a we can put it on heads we up. Do. We can yeah. we, we can do all sorts of things. I, I'm really keen that when we have 
consultations that as many people respond as possible. So yeah, anything to help. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, and we've had quite a few recently as heads through as um, Teams forms, which are quick, easy to go on. You can put all the information in as the information of what the question is going to be about, what the consultation is going to be about, and then all the questions. So maybe something that is quick and easy to access. Yes. Okay. Can I just say yeah. yes? But there is some, obviously, some... Um, sometimes some detailed information which we yeah. need to supply to, mm. supply to each school so or, yeah. or, or to show so it, it, we'll have to tailor it to tailor it to the needs at the time mm -hmm. um just to just to reiterate the points about about the response to the consultation one of the key questions which the uh dfe asked us when we were putting our disapplication in was the results of the consultation num the numbers that that responded numbers of schools uh, that sort of thing so it, it is very key that we that we get, get as, as full a uh, participation as possible okay yeah thanks for that and um can i just say to everybody on here um if you think about something after the meeting um that uh, you, you hadn't necessarily said today then please send it through to Dalbia. um you know if you've got any any suggestions about the consultation and uh, we'll we'll uh, review them and incorporate them in so thanks very much for that okay right if there are no further comments on that then We'll move on, um, but we'll rather back to item five, which is the uh, Delivering Better Value programme. And uh, Ross, are you going to talk to this, having rushed from your previous meeting? Yeah, thanks, Phil. You're, you're getting through the agenda quicker than I anticipated. Uh, well, you so. see, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're all anxious to be out <laughs> in this sunny day. <laughs> so, so thank you. I was just the primary Senco network was at the same time, so I was just just sharing some information with them. Uh, in terms of delivering better value program, uh, so you, you'll already had the update on the outturn of, of the high needs block, and we've we've shared previously had to, discussions what the outlook looks like uh, going forward based on the the analysis that we did through the the delivering better value program. So we'll continue to keep you updated at Schools Forum on uh, on where we are with the the four projects that we were. Uh, focusing on uh, so it just it, this is the first one of them so in terms of the impact we're not necessarily seeing that impact yet because we're only a few months in the inclusion framework is our project which is uh, particularly focusing on trying to support children at SEN support level so without the need for an EHC plan and therefore without the cost of an EHC plan that comes through but really it's about early intervention uh, as, as well meeting those needs at an uh, early stage so uh, we've, we've seen uh, the pilot in rugby that started a couple of years ago with positive results. I think we've shared that in in the paper. Uh, we've we, we're now uh, we've we've got going in in Bedworth, and that's moving ahead well. And um, we've got a uh, what we call a family of schools. We've got sort of families uh, a family of schools in Stratford have come forward and going to start in September as well. So uh, that's a a little bit behind time scale in terms of that third group, but we really wanted to test it in a, a rural area as well in terms of the the inclusion framework. Uh, to make sure we weren't just focusing in urban areas we're focusing in r r rural areas and seeing if the same methodology could be applied so from my point of view I'm kind of very pleased that that work is going ahead and at, at the moment all the indicators all the indicators are that the uh, the approach that they take through the inclusion framework does indeed help support a number of children be supported at SEN support uh, rather than with EHC plans uh, the work the workforce development area is particularly around trying to support schools and equip schools to support children with the HC plans to be to maintain their their, their current placements in in mainstream schools. Uh, we're still developing that. We're really trying to do that with schools. Uh, so we've got Jen R R Roberts, former head at uh, Oakwood Special School, uh, and Kerry McLean from Queen's Junior Junior School on a central group. Uh, and a surveys have been sent out this week. Uh, to two Senkos asking for further advice. There's, there's been a number of meetings with uh, with uh, Senkos and special school heads and others as well. So we, in terms of that piece of work, which I think is going to be really important about equipping staff, uh, that's really still in the, the design phase. The one which has moved forward more than others is the resource provision. And this is the one which will have most financial impact in terms of uh, different uh, a, a different cost for, for, for placements and trying to prevent those placements in independent specialist provision. Uh, so I'm pleased to say we're kind of moving ahead. 
We've got 18 resource provisions at the moment. There's eight new resource provisions due to open in September. Having a number of conversations uh, with schools, which I'll, I won't reveal the names of those schools because it's the conversation with, with them, but we're looking to set up uh, a two in every primary consortia if we, if we can, as well as uh, in the in, in this in the secondary area heads groups as as well. So we have you know, I've come back today from a visit to one school about setting up a resource provision and a team's meeting about an, another one. So those, I'm really pleased with some of the conversations going, going on. We're currently ahead of schedule in terms of the numbers that we want to be. I think there's still some work to be done. Uh, re regarding that, uh, in, in, but I'm, I'm pleased with the responses that we're getting uh, so far on the pipeline that we're that, that we're growing not only for this September but for September 25 as well. Uh, it's not quite a resource provision, but just uh, Nikki, I can see you on my screen, and we've done some work around early years, which is we've called it an enhanced provision, slightly different, but again trying to be across the age ranges there, uh, in trying to make sure we've got different provisions available and commissioning places in advance. Uh, so that's moving forward well. We'll see more of the impact of that uh, from September with the, how, as those places are used. The, the, the fourth one really is, is less about financial savings. The digital infrastructure is about really kind of com communication and our kind of productivity uh, in terms of how we work in, with our internal systems. Excuse me. So that's how we're moving forward on, on those. So at this point, I think all, all of those are in early stages. Resource vision, which will have the most impact, is most advanced. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ross. So in, in paragraph 2.2, um, you mentioned at the um, bottom of the page that uh, there remains a shortfall of resource provisions in the secondary phase, particularly in the neat and rugby areas. What what are the barriers there? So it's it's up to a school whether they want to host a resource provision or, or not. We, we can't yeah. direct a school uh, to, to do so. Uh, the th there's usually three I would say in my experience, there's usually three things which which kind of uh, which at least had say 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 to me are the issues of why they 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 don't want to set one up. One is sometimes just the practicalities of space, um, and I'm pleased to say one of the things we've we've got is we've got, we've we've had additional capital funding uh, put in, and we're prioritising resource provisions. Sometimes that's helpful if if the school grounds allow for extra buildings. Sometimes you know schools are very landlocked in terms of where they are and, and there, there are practical difficulties to overcome so we so we re 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 realize that uh, in terms of other, other reasons some schools want to make sure that there's a benefit to themselves as a school and um, more recently when we've been having those discussions what we do is we look at the school's own cohort of young people with SEN first before we make any other placements because we want to make sure there's a there's a benefit to the host school as well that we're supporting their pupils as well as those who will ultimately come in from elsewhere and also the the last one is schools often don't want to be seen as the as the only one in the a a area and almost feel like they then become like a proxy special school and and I think the the answer to to to, to this is to is to the more resource provisions you have there's almost a, a safety in numbers of having multiple choices of resource provisions rather than everyone having to go to one because that's the local one so we are trying to so i would say is there's got to be groups of schools coming for forward uh not just one school on on on, on their own and those are some of the conversations that we're, we're trying to have at the, 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 the moment okay thank you um johnny do you want to come back on that yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Phil. I hope I'm jumped ahead of uh, of Alice. It's a response to yeah, this. Yeah, um, I'll come back to Alan in a minute, but I just thought you wanted to add to what Ross was saying. So I just wanted to say, I mean, obviously to schools forum members, but also we say at our strategic group that the development of the resource provision across the county in as many schools as possible is probably one of the most key policies that we could ever have to safeguard the future generations of all our young people, because you know, the more that we have, the more specialists we can get in certain areas. So, you know, some schools can have provision for a certain type of um, special educational need. Others can have others and it spreads and it and it distributes the load as well. It gives parents wider choice. It also gives wider choice when it comes to transport as well, so that more young people with special educational needs can have an opportunity to go to a local mainstream school where appropriate and where possible. So I think, you know, what I've picked up here in my time here is that, you know, some schools feel that they do more more than others and, you know, and, and take on more and, and do more. And, you know, so so I guess what I wanted to say is that, you know, this has been recognised by the DfE 
um they're supporting us with it they've given us funding to expand the resource provision it was something we wanted to do anyway but i can't impress upon you know how big an approach this is last year we issued 700 ehc plans this year we're on track to issue 1100 that's an increase of 400 that's the best if my maths is correct so it's just 20 or 25 percent there so if that continues to increase we will need these resource provisions and we will need provision for young people in schools even four years down the line five years down the line so you know we need to get those provisions in as soon as we can at a cost effective uh you know uh, in, a, in a cost effective way for us there so yeah hopefully school forms are all behind that and schools are all behind that but like i say this is about safeguarding the future as well and spreading the load thanks thank you very much thank you alan alan will you please <laughs> Oh, I must be logged in under my, under my dad's name. It's Sarah. Oh, sorry, I don't beg your pardon. <laughs> a little bit confused. Sorry. Um, that was okay. I just wanted to ask for a, for a bit more detail about um, the enhanced or resource provision or enhanced provision for early years. It's not really something that has been on offer for um, children under school age in Warwickshire, um, like, well, locally around us. So what, what do you envisage um, for early years places? So where, where, where we've start, started there is we we started working with, with the nursery schools to begin with and say, do we need to commission places a little bit differently? There's been a lot of toing and froing with them about what that would look like, whether we did that just in one setting or across multiple settings. And we've agreed to test something out for the next year, looking at two 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 places in each uh, n n n nursery schools. We know that that's only part part of the picture in terms of n n nursery schools as well. That's, that, you know, we've got... That kind of runs down the, the spine, if you like, of, of of the county, but we know that not every is, is not every area is covered by a, a nursery school as well. But we're kind of testing a bit of a a, a model of commissioning places and in kind of additional funding, uh, and the way that it's going to work in early years is. Um, is it's not necessarily just going to be based on those who already have ehc plans because obviously you're in the stage where you're identifying those needs and you're you're identifying what so, what some of those uh, waiting a further 20 weeks when the child clearly has very high needs isn't necessarily the most appropriate way of doing it so i think we're exploring that i don't know if, if, if nikki wants to to come in any, any further but we're exploring commissioning small numbers of places for very high needs and trying to do that in advance can i just ask just to clarify so two two places so two children in each of the seven nursery schools six yeah six okay okay so tw okay that we're, we're we're testing it out Sarah, because what we what we've got is um we've got more children with the hc plans being issued at, a, at an earlier age which is releasing that funding but what came back to us quite clearly was there are children where we're still with very high needs that we're having to wait for and we need to have the the funding and the uh, and, and the staffing in place to support them straight away and not wait for all of those processes. So this we're testing it out this year. We, we're in a position of not wanting to 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 give out so much money that we then claw it back if we think it's it's not being used in the most efficient way. So we're doing it a little bit at a time, but we've kind of uh, I think we're this is a step forward in the approach to how we support commissioning places in uh, early years. So it's kind of a, a watch this space situation. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I just want to say out loud there is a huge amount of need in early years for um, for more enhanced or resource provision. Um, you know, since we saw the nursery class close in Ridgeway years ago, um, and that was our only local one. There's there's just been a huge gap, um, and more and more children, just as you're seeing in schools, in our nurseries and preschools, needing extra support. So yeah i hope to hear much more from you guys about that soon Joe, oh, th thank you very much um i'll come to jill next jill do you want to tell um school forum members about about um, your provision at um stocking ford uh yeah stocking ford hosts two provisions one for uh, one is a cni base for children who have um, communication difficulties and or autism and the other is an SAMH base so I was interested in what Ross was saying around the reasons why there are potential barriers. And I'm, I wondered if 
we've heard anything around uh, outcomes, pupil outcomes and the way that schools are assessed by raw data and attainment, if that's perhaps factoring into people's decision making. You know, we, we have to tell a data story twice over, once to include the children within these provisions on our EHCs, which now stand at 39 EHCs at, at Stopping Ford, um, including those children, but 39 across uh, a 500 place school. Um, that was one thing I thought. And my other, my other thought, and I don't know if it's a Johnny question or a Ross question or, or a bit of both, um, was where do APs sit as opposed to RP? So what about the, those provisions as well? Because the effective early intervention, robust early intervention for SEMH children to prevent permanent exclusion and or the need for specialist provision, does that sit inside this or separate? Uh, so if, 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 if I pick up, so in, in terms of uh, the the outcomes, yeah, you're right, um, Julie, in terms of you you are asked when kind of offset come, come around, look at the data twice. That, Particularly with primary schools, that, that that's not something which has put people off. That they've wanted to make sure that Ofsted kind of understand uh, what they're saying, and I think we would always back you up as resource provisions and local authority would be on hand to to explain the situation. I think we, you know, you're in an area with a very high le le level of need, reflected by the number of children with the HC plans you have, and your yours is one of, one of the areas uh, in Nuneaton with primary schools where we're saying actually we think we need more resource provisions, not just two in a consortium. We can have more there. So that not everyone with that kind of next level of need is is, is coming to, to to you. So that's certainly, you know, it costs good to hear. We, we do have a lot of parents. I mean, we're now up to five ten, and we were below below five hundred within the year. And they are predominantly families with children with additional needs who are having the school recommended to them. Yeah. Well, well. Did it, so you're aware one of the schools I was at, at speaking to today about resource provision was in the Nuneaton uh, primary school in the, the Nuneaton area. So we are we're, we're certainly looking to kind of expand further in terms of, of that. And as, as I say, your particular area is an area of high need. And we I don't think we would just stop at two uh, in a consortium for that. That's where we'd be looking uh, more broadly in terms of the uh, the AP agenda i trying to i don't know i think your your hand went up at that point so i don't know if it, that that shared between myself and matt biggs my colleague johnny i don't know if, did you want to come back in on on the ap agenda yeah so i mean the the, the ap agenda is obviously another huge agenda for us because it's part as for all of us uh, and is part of the we've got an ap strategic group at the moment we're working with head teachers I've got to say, I've been absolutely delighted with the response from Warwickshire Heads across the county, um, you know, in response to this, to, to try and get something up and running. It's obviously not as, in terms of capital funding, we don't have as much as for the SRPs, because that's a that's a separate work stream and part of the DBV and all the rest of it. But there is a budget for AP, and we are looking at trying to look at more creative solutions where schools can host, such as yourself, um, and where... We can have outreach programs and where we could do all sorts of things. So that is very high up on the agenda. We will obviously be using some high needs block money for that as well. Um, so, so yeah, it, it does fit in and it is separate from the SRP. However, it's all related, isn't it? If we look at the exclusions and the rise in exclusions, there's a number of young people with SEND that are being excluded. There's a young number of people that have children looked after that are being excluded. And whilst each school is looking, obviously looking at their own school and their own young people, what we're doing as a county is showing strategically to heads what's how it's it's got it's gone up triple since last year. And this is the generation that will be disenfranchised. And when you look at the statistics of the likelihood of young people that will turn to crime or carry knives once they've been excluded, it's very high. So whilst as a school you might feel like you're protecting your immediate school if you like the community is not necessarily safer unless we collectively get together to 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 try and work together to do that and matt's doing some great work and looking at some putting in some funding from the la and schools contributing bit by bit as well so that we can create a really big part so it's a slightly different approach there with, with the ap but i'm pleased that you raised it julian because it's 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 very much interconnected and 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 with the srp 
I agree with you. I, I don't know what what a, what a barrier is uh, potentially. I mean, there's some that Ross has pointed out, some logistical ones that you know that may be beyond the control of the schools. But uh, just to caveat, I have not experienced it here in Warwickshire, but in my previous authority, which which upset me quite a lot, was some schools believing that if they had some kind of resource base or what's there were some that already had one. I was saying, well, we're so successful that everybody wants to send their children here that have special educational needs, as if that's a negative thing. And so I just think it's, it's about mindset as well. And, you know, I do appreciate schools have shrinking budgets and lack of resources and are dealing with more complex children. But we need to all collectively get together to have that inclusive mindset and that we're all supporting each other. So. We'll continue to champion that um, with schools as well and, and as part of the strategy. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Nikki. Yeah, just to build on what Ross and Sarah were talking about, I think, Sarah, I think you, you spot on, you know, the level of needs in that early intervention. And I think it's really exciting that the local authority are taking on a pilot model that will hopefully then be able to be rolled out. And, you know, in the Warwickshire uh, Partnership Board meetings, you know, we've got heads from such an expert range and we're looking post 25, you know, on 0 to 25. And we all, all agree that early intervention is key and can make a massive difference in the infrastructure. Um, so it's quite an extent and pilot um and also just to link with that you know last year just before the uh, delivering better value program came fully into its um it all the, the, the detail it's in now we were working on the hep matrix and you know early intervention you know early year settings now have a different model with the matrix and it, it is really trying to get that funding in and as rob uh, as um, ross said either through ids funding or through ahps so we have really championed that from an early stage which hopefully has a massive effect uh, for that child and the pathway of that child so i think it's re really exciting for early years thank you very much for that nikki uh, blake francis please um yeah the the um one thing i can't help but feel is that seeing alternative provision and the resource provisions in a completely separate work stream is that it's not that integrated approach and actually what we're talking about really is alternative curriculum to meet the needs of students and the using like the term ap is for me in a, in a secondary school you have to look at it as an alternative curriculum because if it's going to be sat within the school it's it's an alternative curriculum model and seeing them both so separate just concerns me that actually bringing it more together um certainly in a secondary school i think we could meet a lot of the needs of children who are getting ehcps and then we're having to to see, source specialist provision by just having greater resource in the school to be able to offer an alternative curriculum model um with smaller group environment and and all of that so and now our needs as a, a secondary school are really broad um and i guess one thing that concerns me about an srp is just it, it being quite niche and targeted towards a particular type of type of students needs whereas actually what we need is something that will meet a broader range of needs than that to to be able to get them to to um to access the curriculum and then the other big concern i have is around having an srp is around leadership capacity um and the then recruitment and retention of staff to source and rec and, and kind of run that that area of the school um and not necessarily being an expert in setting one of those up in terms of a, a specialist resource provision. Um, it concerns me about who would be the right person to lead that. Have we got the leadership capacity to do that without impacting on the rest of the, the school? And then will we get the right staff? Because any any area of school like that is is dependent on having the right people in place. Um, and with a, 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 yeah, particular challenges in recruitment, of staff recently in in all areas of the school um that that is kind of one of my my big concerns particularly great thank you uh, ross do you want to come back on that i i'll let johnny respond to the joined upness i'll come back into the leadership of the srp point all right thank I you johnny. Uh, i think ross was probably beating me to it i think there's plenty of experience of setting those up and Looking at those and and supporting schools that um that want to do it, I, I do I, I think I think that mindset, Blake, of what you've just said about it being an alternative curriculum, I think is fabulous. You know, it, it, you're absolutely right. It is it is about that, and I think the language is important. 
as well for that. So I totally agree with that. Um, I suppose with the SRP, there are there are niche areas with that. So, for example, a school that I'm a governor in, it where I live, has got an SRP, and it's it's particularly for hearing impaired young people. Now that's that's close to me. I'm I'm hearing impaired myself. I wear hearing aids, and you know, without that, those young people wouldn't have a local place to go. Do you see what I mean? And be part of a mainstream education. So that that's kind of the thinking behind the SRPs. They're not necessarily just for dealing with, you know, that they could be more specialist as well for specific reasons and, and the expertise will go in there. But it does afford young people the opportunity to go to an, a mainstream school. At the moment, one of our issues here in Warwickshire is that through a lack of SRP, young people are going straight to special school. And that's that's probably not right or not fair for them. So it's part of it. But we can address all these things with any schools that that, that want to set them up. So but I do like I do like your I do like your um your mindset about alternative curriculum and stuff. So I think we'll look forward to working with you on that when we um you know when we have our inclusion agenda. Thanks. Okay, thank Sorry, you. Ross. Um Ross, I'm just gonna bring Andy Mason in and then um I'll let you sum up. Okay, Andy. Uh, yeah, just wanted to um, really echo what Blake said about the alternative curriculum. There are num there is a minority of children in each school who, for the mainstream setting, doesn't work. Um, but equally, we, we don't want to put them out an alternative provision. Um, it, I don't think it's good for them to necessarily go to a different place. Um, and then there's all the travel and the cost. If we can find a way to retain them in school without them in some respects creating disruptions we have a number of students who we have some limited alternative provision on site and we've tried with key stage three and four which is quite successful at keeping people out of permanent exclusion it also things a disruption in the main school so it does need to be outside the just outside of your main school really in a separate building um and it's just sort of helped towards expand or, or support that but mainly to aim, uh, look at what what chance you give those students for the future in terms of employability skills so they might not go away with eight, eight exams or 10 exam results but if you can skill them in something that will give them employment then that is a real benefit to them their life chances so that alternative curriculum is very much about giving them a, a, a giving them a almost a lifeline for their next step rather than through okay. through traditional education so anything that we can do to support developing that because that's a lower cost model than probably alternative provisions and other things um, and you also then create you, you retain your leadership and um, your staffing and you can use your whole resource in your school to support that which is what we do we, we put maths teachers in english teachers and we move them around but you need someone overseeing it in each school uh, to do it effectively just of the right who can relate to those kids thank you very much for that paul hostead please yeah, thank you. I was just going to add to, to what's been said. I think one of the things we need to really come to with alternative provision, and I do, I do like the phrase alternative curriculum, is because there is a, a significant isolation effect of some young people when they go to alternative provisions that they're then out of their normal communities of schools, they're out from peer groups and things like that. So I think, and also there can sometimes be a lack of ambition for these young people, and I think that's what we need to keep in mind, that just because they're doing an alternative curriculum doesn't necessarily mean that we should then de-skill and devalue some of the things that they're doing. So I think it's just keeping that in mind that in anything that we're doing, it keeps that rigour, it keeps that ambition for the young people, make sure that we're not um, isolating or removing them from communities that are actually very often in terms of mental health and things, a support mechanism as well. OK. Um, thank you very much. Right. Um, Ross, do you want to sum up then, please? <laughs> yeah. So thank you. I mean, I, that's a, I think it's a really constructive di 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 discussion that we've had there. And I mentioned in the... Um, I, I mentioned... It, it, in, in the paper about the workforce development and how we're asking schools to help design that. And I think actually that's an opportunity to take that discussion further about where SEND and AP really kind of overlap and where they don't. Obviously, I think I'd, I'd point to, to some of the legal constrictions and restraints we have around EHC plans and so forth, but that's the place to put it in. That's why we're, we're trying to say, well, this is this is something we need to work together on to, to, get, to get it right. What does it look like from a curriculum view, from a training view, from experience view? Um, and Blake, um, in, in terms of how, how those agendas overlap, we're not, 
I kind of feel like we're working closer than we have done in the past. That that that, that doesn't mean we can't work closer in in the future and in terms of what that looks like. So I feel like a couple of years ago we were very separate in kind of what what we did in terms of a council and just continue to engage with us on that dis discussion and the different models of how how, how we go uh, for foot forward with, with that. Thank you. Yeah, it feels like it feels like we're moving in the right direction, Ross. Definitely. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Ross, for that, for your report. And uh, thanks, everybody, for your uh, your contributions on that. It's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you. OK, moving on then to the um, almost final item, which is the um, forward plan. Dalbia. Thank you. The, uh, the next meeting will be on 26th of September. It's going to be on Teams again. And we were going to bring a de-delegation of papers, the result, the consultation results for, uh, in that meeting for decision. And there will be six items for information and comments. And the meeting after that, it will, it will be in November, extraordinary meeting. And we're not decided on the dates. They either could be 5th or 7th of November. But we're trying to find a meeting room to meet face to face so that everybody can have a chance to meet each other. So I will confirm that once we can find a meeting room and also with the couple of members joining us uh, from schools, I will send uh, school members updated a list with the, the voting and action paper as well. Thank you. Bill. OK, thank you. Um, I think the venue, I'm assuming the uh, venue we used last year is uh, is on offer again, is it uh, Dalbia? Uh, we haven't asked them there. We're trying to find something in the Shire Hall if we can. OK. But I haven't asked them at the present. If you want me to ask them, I can ask well, them. Well, I know. I mean, Shire Sh Hall is fine, but it, I mean, if if one of the uh, if Warwickshire County Council buildings aren't available, then I, I think that's a good second choice. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into it as well. Yeah, if yeah, we can't I'm, find I'm some. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I know they're they're always keen to offer that, Nikki. Yeah, thank you. And do we need to consider Andy's point earlier of maybe the nineteenth of June being a week earlier, possibly to yes, make it more will... attendance? Consider that as well, as long as the council and the cabinet's meeting not uh, yeah. contradicting with it, we will consider that as well. Thank you. Lovely. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Yes, Paul, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I was uh, promising your venue and uh, uh, yes, I probably should have asked you first. Right. OK, thanks. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Um, right. Uh, the only thing is um, the Chair's business. The only thing I've got is um, I would just like to uh, formally congratulate uh, Panema on her new role and uh, thank her very much for her uh, um, consistent support for this forum at every meeting and uh, personally uh, for the support and advice that she's given me, me as chair over the years. So thank you very much, uh, Panema. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you very much. OK, all right. Well, uh, we'll see you all um, at the next meeting on the 26th of uh, September then. Thank you very much for your attendance today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.